As I mentioned in the beginning of a seminar, this, uh, these kind of uh, international events, they wouldn't be possible to arrange without a good European, good international network. And uh, Kalevi Sorsa Foundation has been lucky that from the start, from the beginning, it has had such a European network. And uh, at the heart of that network, who's organizing events all around Europe is FEPS, uh, Foundation for European Progressive Studies. And I'm extremely pleased that the uh, General Secretary of FEPS, Ernst Stetter, had a time and possibility to visit this seminar, particularly this seminar, uh, because of its uh, importance and uh, actuality at the moment in Europe. I mean, he comes from Brussels and uh, everybody who has been, you have all followed the news, what's happening in Paris, how it affects Brussels. So I'm extremely grateful that you had found, found time and possibility to join us 10th anniversary uh, as a foundation and 10th, 10th anniversary as our joint seminar uh, with FEPS. And as I mentioned in the booklet we distributed today, uh, there are also other events we have organized together with FEPS and planning to do so uh, every year, once maybe in the spring and once in the, in, in, in the fall. And on the top of that, FEPS arranges a lot of quality uh, events in Brussels and we've been uh, we as a foundation has been, uh, have been uh, participating in those and I would say that FEPS provides us much more possibilities where we actually have strength and uh, possibility to join. And I think uh, our next decade as a think tank, this is a uh, dimension that we should concentrate more effort. But please uh, welcome uh, Ernst Stetter, and I give you the floor. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Mika. Thank you so much also giving me uh, today the opportunity to address you uh, on the issue on, on, on migration and integration in Europe. But uh, before starting, uh, I would like to say something on what happened in Brussels this weekend, because I left this morning at uh, five o'clock and uh, I left with very, very mixed feelings, my home and my family, because um, I think for uh, somebody who has lived now for more than 15 years in, uh, in Brussels, uh, what we have so far had this weekend was not extraordinary, it was not uh, exceptional, it was just uh, a way you cannot believe that such a thing can happen in the, in the European capital. Uh, all the shops were closed on Saturday, all the uh, metro is not working. Uh, if you go in the city, uh, we are living a bit at the border, there is military, there is tanks, there is people standing there, soldiers standing, standing there with, with uh, heavy weapons. There is police everywhere. It's an incredible situation. You cannot believe that this is a situation that you live in a European capital and you have to feel that you feel insecure in a, in a situation. Last night, uh, it was announced that this kind of level four, as they call it, will be prolonged today, so the whole day today. There is also no metro, there is also no schools open, there is no cinema, there is no theater, there is no university open. Uh, we don't know if this will continue. Uh, but on the other side, a city, a European capital, capital cannot be uh, closed down for days and days in such a situation. Uh, last night, the police and, and the military, they have done, uh, it seems, uh, 19 different investigations uh, all over Brussels. Uh, more than 16 people have been arrested, but there was a kind of a, uh, a way that police and also the government was not communicating what's going on. So we don't know in Brussels what is really going on, if there is uh, something essential happening concerning that they are looking for two suspicious terrorists, uh, one who was uh, implicated in the Paris attacks uh, and, and he uh, uh, went back to, to, to uh, 
uh, to Brussels in this quartier called Molenbeek. Uh, since then, he disappeared. We don't know if he's still there or if he's, he's outside. So. Please, the situation is not easy, and uh, the situation is also not easy when we are discussing today the, the question of migrants and integration, because what cannot happen, I think, and this is clear, that we mix up what is happening with uh, this, what happened in Paris with the terrorist attacks, and what is the problem uh, that we have to integrate migrants within all this what we have discussed so far uh, already um, in the in the first session i'm really glad and i'm i'm really honored also to to be here uh, and and miko made it very clear that fabs since the beginning we have been working very very closely uh, together with Khalifi sosa foundation and uh, Miko is also a member of our scientific council and, and we are in an ongoing intellectual debate uh, together with our Finnish friends and I'm happy that I can also be here at the 10th anniversary of the foundation and, and give a little kind of impression what we think at FAPS on the question on migration and integration uh, in Europe. These past 10 years uh, has brought many challenges, I will say, uh, to us in Europe and has seen the frame of the debate dramatically uh, changing. Migration and integration has been always high on the agenda in, in Europe, but from an informed evidence-based policy debate, the discussion shifted more and more to a discourse where the very fundaments of the European Union are questions today. The right to asylum, Schengen, respect for human rights, these are all at stake as exclusionary political narratives challenges their universal, universality. FAPS has very much welcomed what happened uh, in the last month uh, on, on the level of the European Commission and the proposals on migration. But in our debates, in our intellectual debates, we believe that there is a, a clear need to go beyond these proposals, what has been put on the table. And we have summarized this uh, in the following, and don't worry, uh, it will not be long, but uh, we have uh, developed so far 15 points we think which is uh, uh, necessary to debate about. And the first one goes back a bit to the fundaments of our societies and the fundaments of the philosophy uh, on which we are based on. It goes back to Immanuel Kant, 1795, and I think Kant was also here in, in, in Helsinki and Finland, and he stipulated that universal hospitality and human rights had to be at the center of every evolving asylum and refugee policy. He already said this in 1795. Upholding European values starts with the unambiguous acknowledgement for refugees and asylum seekers of legal obligations under international conventions. I think this is sometimes missing currently in the debate. And this has to also be, this kind of uh, debate has to be done on the basis of what we have agreed so far within the European Union and within the member states of the European Union. Before calling, no, beyond calling for more union, more solidarity, and responsibility sharing in line with the letter of the spirit of the Lisbon Treaty is definitely clearly needed. The summit on the 9th of November, uh, September of the European Commission and uh, the decision on the emergency relocation system is needed, but the relocation of 160,000 people from Greece, Italy and Hungary to other EU member states is not a matter of solidarity, and this goes back to this is what I said, but a matter of a legal and a moral duty. And the necessity is so obvious when we listen to the figures which have been given on the one hand. On the other hand, we have to be also very careful in saying, well, the EU has decided that so far till today, from these 160,000 decided 50 or 55 people have been relocated. So uh, you see this, this, well, there is a kind of a plan of action, there is a kind of a, a thing which is going on, but the implementation afterwards is very, very difficult and is often not done in the way as it should be done. 
The harmonization, point number two, number three, the harmonization and acceleration of asylum decision processes is a matter of urgency. However, there are dangers of setting up a safe countries uh, of origin list which might undermine the integrity of the asylum procedure. Uh, I think later on we will talk also on the question of what's going on in Germany. When you have a situation that uh, it takes more than three or four years uh, to make a decision if somebody gets asylum or not, this is not acceptable. Four years waiting for having a paper that you are an asylum seeker, what does this mean? You are four years in uncertainty living in a country and you have no rights, you have nothing, you cannot even, in some countries, can even not work. Where is your economic basis on this kind of uh, living? The other point is, the introduction of a Euro European humanitarian visa would contribute to safer entries. There is a need for establishing legal channels for refugees to come to Europe as close to the conflict region as possible. A lot of things would have been much easier, we think at FAPS, if this kind of humanitarian uh, visa has been uh, established earlier and, and, and has been there on, on the thing. Today it's quite easy to travel. I traveled this morning from Brussels to Helsinki without any problem. But on the question that refugees are coming to the European Union, this is the whole doubling system which is behind. This is the whole procedure which is behind. They cannot just buy a ticket, for example, in Istanbul or in Ankara to, to, to go to one of the European countries. So if there is this question that you can have a way and the European Union is trying to establish this now with the so-called, I, I don't like this word, hotspots. I don't know what does this mean in, 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 in practice. But nevertheless, that people are already, when they are asking asylum, then also the relocation can be done a bit perhaps better than it's now to open them up just to entry and then they flee through the Balkans and come to Hungary and Austria. So this is a, a terrible situation for a lot of people. So if we try to establish this kind of uh, humanitarian visa and we give a possibility that people can also go directly then to a country where they are assigned to go, then perhaps the situation is not so dramatic or, or can be de-traumatized uh, to a certain extent. It's clear that more refugees will come and European leaders need to be prepared to go beyond this first step of 160,000 people very, very soon. And that what was proposed by the European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, that the quota system, which is under discussion, must be a permanent mechanism. This is quite obvious, I think, uh, because people will be on the move also in the next years. And what we heard so far, uh, the war in Syria will not be settled very quickly. And there will be a situation for the coming upcoming years that there will be still a huge number of refugees seeking asylum within the European Union. Also, the UK, Ireland and Denmark, who are not legally committed to the EU migration and asylum policy, have to contribute their fair share to mitigating the migration and refugee crisis. The same goes for other associated states, notably Switzerland, Norway and Iceland. Progress is seen in, its, in stabilizing the central Mediterranean refugee pathway, but this situation remains still intolerable. And the EU needs to replace operations with a sustained permanent policy that ensures EU interventions in the long run. Hence, the urgency is clear to set up a European border and coast guard system with a strong humanitarian dimension and with utmost respect for human rights. The Europe European Commission should also be encouraged to establish a reporting mechanism on the implementation of the search and rescue obligation of all Mediterranean countries, including the EU member state concerns, and the better involvement of the civil society organization in delivering services does not mean that the state can abandon its duty to protect. However, member states should be encouraged to consider the setting up or reinforcement as appropriate of volunteer service to support smooth and dignified asylum determination procedures. 
civil society should be encouraged to engage much more with its communities and regional authorities to establish platforms for the operation, coordination and implementation of civil society activities. Perhaps we have also to look back a bit on with that respect that most of this what is happening within the European Union and with the question of the integration is a matter of fact how this is done on the municipal level, how this is done on the local level. This is very, very important in a way. And I remember always when I was a kid uh, in, the, in, the, in the 60s and 50s in my little village where I grew up, we had, uh, it was in the south of Germany, we had a lot of refugees coming from uh, Eastern Europe uh, as a consequence of the, of the Second World War. My village where I grew up was at that time a village of 1,500, uh, 3,000 inhabitants. Today more than 20,000 people are living there and most of them came in the 50s and the 60s. And th there was a kind of a process of integration which was based that people were accepted on the local levels. So I cannot understand, and this is clear, why some of the governments within the European Union are stating that they cannot accept refugees, especially in Eastern European countries. It's not acceptable that uh, heads of government are stating we don't accept Muslims in our country. This is not at all acceptable, such kind of a way to uh, stipulate also what we discussed earlier on the question uh, that this can give much more um, let's say for the populist movement, uh, uh, an argument and saying, well, you know, even in some of the countries, uh, refugees are not welcome. So the local authorities and local civil society organizations are in the front line of the integration process. All EU member states need to prepare systematically for welcoming high numbers of asylum seekers. Capacity will have to be expanded to move from crisis management to swift and sustainable policy implementation. And it's also clear that the European Union and its member sta states should engage uh, should engage in its neighborhood by enhancing international solidarity with countries of conflict and first arrival of refugees. This was uh, discussed already concerning uh, Turkey. We should also go on the European level beyond voluntary contributions in order to engage swiftly at the international level when it's imperative to do so. National protection mechanism in our neighboring countries must be strengthened, including through more EU development and Euro human humanitarian assistance, redirecting to this cause. This includes close cooperation with uh, the United Nations High um, UNGR on the setting up and strengthening of national asylum determination uh, procedures. And as concerns other actors, the EU and its member states are encouraged to act jointly in international fora, such as the UN, to broaden solidarity with the victims of the Syrian conflict, including by mobilizing the support of other nations, such as the United States, Canada, or the Gulf states. But last but not least, and I think we don't have a solution at the moment, but it could be a way that we do much more on the diplomatic channels. And it's very promise, promising what's going on now on the European level together with Russia, together with the US, together with the Gulf States, together with Iran, the Vienna talks. And perhaps this brings us uh, at least in the mid-run to a solution of the, of the Syrian uh, conflict. There is something I would like to, to end up when the president of FEBS, which is the former prime minister of Italy, uh, was prime minister in the 90s. There was the Kosovo war um, uh, going, uh, going on. And he recently made a statement, we have a coordination uh, meeting every month together with the European commissioners uh, and the group in, in the European Parliament. He said, well, at that time, we just called each other as heads of state. We called and we said, well, there is a problem we have to resolve. Perhaps today there is also time that our governments, our heads of, of, of state are having a much closer relation, sometimes on the phone or so, than always just 
looking for setting up EU councils and coming to, to Brussels and negotiating at the table. I know it's not so easy at the time uh, it was in the 90s because 28 or 29 members is different from 16 or 18 members and uh, it's, it's uh, much more difficult to come uh, to a compromise. Nevertheless, uh, I think there is a need that we find very clearly, very quickly, a solution uh, what is going on in Syria, not only uh, in a way uh, how the situation on the spot uh, can be solved, but also when I started to talk to you on the question in which way we can also settle this whole problem of ISIS. Thank you very much for your attention.